All right, so we started a message, a message series a couple weeks ago. I'm like a caged animal right now. Okay, so we started a message series a couple weeks ago, and, and, and if you remember what it is, tell your neighbor what the, the message series is called. Please, please, please. It's called Faithful. It's called Faithful. And, and tonight, uh, I'm, in, I'm in last night. Okay, and this morning, we're going to continue on, and, and this morning, I just want to paint a picture for you that says that God's faithfulness isn't always pretty, but it's always reliable, and, and we're going to talk about that this morning, but just to kind of recap a little bit and go backwards a little bit before we, so we can pull the slingshot back a little bit, and then we're going to go forward, but you know, being faithful is reliable, you can count on it, you know, unswerving, there was, we had a definition for faithful, but a pattern of faithful, you know, when it's a lot of individual situations where God is faithful, it develops a pattern of faithfulness. And so the, 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 the definition of faithfulness is a consistent pattern of reliability displayed over time. And that's what we're looking for. And we all decided as a group, and I think we were right, that we need to see more of that. The goal of this series is that we would learn to trust God more and then as a result, because we're supposed to be like him, that other people would be able to trust us more. And we've let people down over the years. And people have let us down over the years. Hey, I'll be at this place. I'll do that for you. I'll be there for you. And they let you down. And we need to be people of God that are not like that. We need to be faithful. We, we talked about this last week, that we can move forward with confidence if we can look back and see God's consistency. If we can, I mean, I, we're supposed to live by faith, not by sight. I get that. But can we just be real in church for a minute? I mean, don't we all need to see something? We need to see it. Like if God was totally unreliable, you wouldn't be able to move forward with confidence that he's going to have your back in this new thing that you're facing. We have stuff that we're going to face and we need to look back and see consistency on his behalf. And so since... Time is a long, long line. We want to look at the huge timeline. We're talking about a pattern of consistency, right? We don't want to talk about, you know, this week or, 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 or this month. You know, that's good. And when someone's been unreliable and unfaithful for a long time, and then all of a sudden they, they're like, oh, see, I've been good. I've been good, haven't I? You know, because they've been good for the last two and a half weeks. Like, that's not what we're looking for. We want to look at a, at a long overtime pattern of consistent reliability. And so, more time, more consistency, more confidence, right? And so we went way, way back to the beginning of the timeline, if you will, all the way back to Abraham, to Genesis chapter 12 is where we started with Abraham. And then we're going to take some steps forward in the scriptures to see more faithfulness of God, and we're going to go right up into the end of this message series, we're going to go right into the present. And I'm going to ask something of you guys and the folks on Saturday night as well to step forth and tell of God's faithfulness in your life so we could see that he was faithful to, to Abraham and we could see that he was faithful to Joshua and we could see that he's faithful to these people in Scripture. That's awesome. And that should build faith in you in his faithfulness. But isn't it awesome when the God of Abraham also becomes the God of Paul and of Nick and of Marty, right? That's when it really starts to hit you. When God did something, when he invaded my space, he became more than just this amazing God of the Bible that people are talking about, that Billy Graham's screaming on the stage about. When he invaded my space, I was like, wow, he's real. And I need to hear that. And so we're going to move forward and hopefully people have the guts to get up there and, and give their testimony of God's faithfulness. We need to see if it's true that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God said to Malachi, I am the Lord and I shall not change. And we need to know, hey, is, I mean, that's the claim. Is this really true? We all want to know that, right? I need some, look at your neighbor and say, I need some confidence. I need some confidence, right? I need some confidence. So I need to look back and see the consistency of God over the years so that I can move forward in confidence. If I'm to have faith to move forward in confidence, I need to see a history of God's faithfulness. So we examine the, the interaction between God and Abraham. And it was amazing. He promised him some stuff, right? He promised him this one thing that summarizes all of it. 
I'm going to make you the father of nations. And that all the nations of the world will be blessed through you. They'd be kings, and you'd have descendants, and you'd have land, and it'd be the, this big nation. And we saw that that promise had come to pass. And guess what? You are that promise. Thousands of years later, thousands of miles away, all of a sudden, this promise that God gave Abraham thousands of years ago, now we have a king. We have people, two and a half billion of us across the world and growing every day. And I don't even know how many Christians there's been since the beginning. Billions and billions and billions. And let, guess what? You want to talk about land? We're spread all over the world. Like it's working out well. He, he, he delivers on his promise. So we saw that. But let's just jump forward, like I said, we're going to do in Scripture. Let's just make a little tiny jump. Just 640 years <laughs> to the life of Moses. And I started out by saying that faithfulness isn't always pretty, right? And I say that because as we examine the life of Moses, you got to know that the life of Moses is super ugly. Like, ugly. Right Now definitely there was some great things in his life that happened. Some beautiful things that happened. Like the Red Sea opened. That was pretty cool, right? Can you do that? Yeah. Who says? See, I got you right there. I got you all right there. Who says you can't do that? Was it Moses that did it? Yeah. Right. So it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So you get the point, right? Okay, learning. Learning right there. So... His, his situation was, was ugly for sure, and there were some good things that happened, but it started out pretty, pretty ugly, like super, super ugly, brutal, ugly. It starts actually, this whole story of Moses being injected into this timeline, it started actually in Genesis 15 with Abraham. And I mentioned it last week, like I was preaching, and I got sideways a little bit, and I mentioned this little blurb that's in the story of God and Abraham back, way, way back in Genesis and, I, and, and it was worth mentioning, but this week, I really want to dive deeper into it because I was ready to move on, but when I read that, I, I just felt like God was like, no, 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 you're not going anywhere, man. There's awesome stuff in here, and you need to learn and grow. You, Moses, and you need to pass it on. So I hope that you're ready to, to, to receive this. I hope you're ready to learn and grow. And so let's just do this. Let's go back to Genesis 15. So open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 15. 15, and it's, it's up there on the screen. I hope you have your Bible with you. But if you don't, there's Bibles on the tables and stuff like that. Get your eyes on the Bible. Don't be slacking. Don't be slacking. Oh, you got what she's hiding in. Okay, good girl, good girl, good girl. You know, if my wife's not even looking at one, what am I going to say, right? So she didn't let me down. She's good, 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 good. Love you. So, Genesis chapter 15. Look, um, like verse 8, kind of towards the end of all the promises that God was given Abraham. Abraham, like, he steps to God and he's like, Oh, sovereign Lord, like, how can I be sure that I'll actually possess it? Like, how am I sure that these promises are going to come to pass, Lord? And so, just to summarize, I don't have to read every single thing here, but you see that the Lord answers him and says, Hey, Bring me this animal and that animal and this animal and that animal and I want you to kill him as a sacrifice. That's awesome. And so he does that. And then it says some vultures swoop down and to eat the carcasses, but Abram chased them away. I love that kind of stuff. That's a side note. Meaningless detail. Why is it in there? Because it's real. You know what I mean? If you were making up a fairy tale, why would you even put that in there? It means nothing. You'd be, I would make sure that every single sentence was like convincing argument, Right? But that's not. That's, like, stupid. I'm not offended. Like, sorry, Lord, it's God's word. But, like, that has no significance, really, at all. It just shows how real it is. But watch here in verse 12. As the sun was going down, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a terrifying darkness came down over him. Then the Lord said to Abram, You can be sure that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land, where they will be oppressed as slaves for 400 years. But I will punish the nation that enslaves them, and in the end, they will come away with great wealth. Well, you all know what he's talking about there, right? It's like no big secret. You've seen the movies. You've seen Yul Brenner and Charlton Heston and all. You know what's going down. Now, I just want to say this about this 
section of Scripture, and I'm not saying that it's like the Bible. This is just an opinion and an observation. And this is why you study Scripture, so you can stop and think about it. Don't just buzz through it because it's the daily reading plan and you want to get through the Bible in a year. Guess what that does? Nothing. If you don't get something from it. So you stop and you think and you meditate on the Word. What does it mean, Lord? And what does it mean to me? So I was reading this, and I don't know if this section of Scripture right here is kind of a reprimand for Abraham or what, but you got to know that it does immediately follow Abraham second-guessing God. And I understand that because of what Jesus did, the veil's been torn, and that we can like boldly come before the throne of the Almighty. I get all that. But this kind of stuff, when I read this, it makes me just put a check before I go busting through the door of the sovereign king and go, yo, daddy, I'm home. Because I don't think that that's the way it should work. I think there needs to be a little bit of reverence and awe before, like I get that Jesus said you can come in. I get that Jesus is praying saying, hey, he's with me, she's with me. But I still understand that he's the sovereign king of the universe, the one who spoke and the planets came out of his mouth, the one who said, hey, die, and Ananias and Sapphira were dead on the spot. Like I understand that there was the one who accepted worship and he should have not done that and God made him ate up with worms and he died on the spot. Like that's who we're talking about. And so you don't just... Maybe you just don't second-guess God. When he says, I'm going to do something, maybe you just need to say, okay. I'm just saying maybe. I don't know. But I'm looking at this, and it, it was immediately fall. It seems like everything's going good, and it's immediately following Abraham coming to God and going, yeah, really, I'm not sure if you can do what you say you're going to do. Because it says that, that God came to him, but in the form of a terrifying darkness. And watch what he says, and you can listen to his tone. Listen to God's tone. Abraham says to God, how can I be sure? And God says, well, you can be sure about this. I can almost see God going like this with his head. Well, you can be sure about this. Oh, you don't think? Oh, I can be sure about this. Your people are going to be enslaved for 400 years, kid. I mean, we all are parents. We've had parents. And we're all, most of us are parents. And you remember your parents, and you remember you saying it to your kids when they get snotty and snooty with you, and they try to tell you how it's going to go down, and you're like, oh, really? Well, let me tell you how it's going to go down. That's, that's what I see when I read this. I don't know if it's right or not. That's why I stepped away. But I'm just looking at this going, mm, yeah, I don't know, man. This is how it's going to happen. Oh, how can I be sure? Well, you can be sure about this. Bottom line is like it or not, ugly or not, if God cannot deny himself, and he's not willing to let his name represent failure, then that means all of his promise to Abraham must come to pass. That's it. Whether it's good or not, if he said, your descendants are going to be slaves for 400 years, and I'm going to punish the nation that actually does what I tell them to do, and when you leave, you're going to go from poverty to wealth, if he said it, and he's not willing to deny himself, and he's not willing to let his reputation be smeared, then it's going to happen. So that being said, Exodus 1. Go to Exodus 1. So what you see in Exodus 1 is the promise to Abraham being perfectly executed. As you move forward in time, you see that the promise that God had made to Abraham, that, his, that he would be the father of a nation, and his descendants would be as many as there was sand on the sea and stars in the sky, and you'd have all this land and everything would go well, right? The nation of Israel must live, it has to live on, for you and I to be in this room right now, right? If Israel dies, or is his promise going to come to pass? No. It has to continue, right? So what happens, you see in Exodus 1, you're going to see that the plan of God through Abraham to have a nation is going really well through the person of Joseph. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob has a bunch of kids. One of them's name is Joseph. Joseph is hated by his brothers because his dad liked him more than all the others. They sold him into slavery. That could put a damper on the dream, right? Sells him into slavery, gets bought by Potiphar, this wealthy guy in Egypt. 
Everything starts to go good in Potiphar's house when Joseph's there because it says in Scripture because God was with him. And Potiphar noticed, hey, this guy, he's not my faith, he's not my religion, prays to a different God, but you know what? Ever since he got here, things are just rocking. So he, he promotes him. Now he's like in charge of this guy's property and his palace and all of his possessions. He's like in charge. Well, apparently David, I mean, uh, Joseph was a hot dude. And Potiphar's wife took a liking to him. And so she tried to get with him. And he didn't want to dishonor God. And he didn't want to dishonor his, his master, Potiphar. He was a respectful, honest guy. So he runs, and the lady screams rape. So he gets arrested, gets thrown in jail. So that's not good, right? We got a dream to fulfill here. We got a promise that's going to happen, but now I'm in jail. But while he's in jail, the jail warden sees, hey, this guy's awesome, puts him in charge of the jail. And then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, has this wacky dream, and nobody can interpret what the dream is, but this guy Joseph is good at interpreting dreams, so they drag him out of the jail, put him into the palace, and he interprets the dream properly, so Pharaoh's like, this guy's rocking, and he promotes him to be the second in charge of the most powerful nation in the world. Awesome, right? And what happens is, now remember, God made a promise to Abraham. You're going to be the father of nations, descendants, land, kingdoms. Awesome, right? There's a famine in the land. And the only place that has any food is Egypt. So all of Joseph's brothers, which are the start of the Israeli nation, which has to live for us to get Jesus so we could be, right? This has to happen. They're all going to die because of a famine. They go to Egypt and they find out that the guy in charge of all the food was their younger brother that they sold to slavery years ago and he's alive and he gives them food so they could live so you can live. This is what's happening in Exodus. And then, Exodus 1.6. Y'all there? In time, Joseph and all his brothers died. Okay? Ending that entire generation. But their descendants, see how it lived on? The Israelites had many children and grandchildren. In fact, they multiplied so greatly that they became extremely powerful and filled the land. So it's continuing. The promise is coming to pass. Eventually, a new king, that would be the Pharaoh. That's the name of, of you know, like Rome was the Caesar and Egypt was Pharaoh. Didn't matter what, who you were. When you became king, you were the Pharaoh. They thought he was God. He thought he was God. Eventually, this new king came to power in Egypt, and he knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. Out of sight, out of mind, right? He said to his people, he said to his people in Egypt, the king said, look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. And if we don't, and war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us then they will escape from the country. Like, our whole nation relies on them. We need, we need them to be suppressed so that we can be king and we can rule, right? So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build the cities of Pithom and Ramses as supply centers for the king, for Pharaoh. Listen. <laughs> But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread. I just got to make a point, okay? When God makes a promise to do something, it doesn't make any difference what the government does. It doesn't make any difference what the, the, the ACLU or whatever, any organization that comes, the atheists try to do, whatever they try to do to suppress and oppress and persecute, you can see there and you can see in the modern day that the more the church is persecuted, the more it grows. Nothing will stop the plans of God. You understand? He's going to move forward. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. I'm going to win, right? So, so you see that it doesn't matter what, what they do to try to stop it. God is greater than he that's in the world and he is going to win. So, so it says... So the Egyptians were alarmed, and the Egyptians worked the people of Israel without mercy. 
They made their lives bitter and forcing them to mix mortar and make bricks and do all the work in the fields. They were ruthless in all their demands. Now, did that help? No. It didn't stop the promise of God. It didn't stop the spirit of God. It didn't stop the nation of God, the kingdom of God. It will always come to pass. It's always going to win. And so uh, God is faithful for sure. And it would seem that although ugly, the situation is very, very ugly, right? I mean, nobody likes slavery. Nobody likes that they're living without mercy and they're brutal and slavery and all that. But God is faithful to his word, isn't he? See, I mean, it's not pretty. It's not good. Like, nobody wants to be a slave and whipped and beaten and all that and make, you know, bricks with no straw, you know. But, but, but he's, he's faithful to what he said. He said this is what's going to happen. And look, hundreds of years go by, and here it is. It's happening. Okay, so here, let me let the cat out of the bag. I know this is like a, you've come to, the, to Revolution Church, of all churches, because the pastor is the, the most brilliant theologian, and he's the oracle of God, right? You ready? Here we go. God chooses Moses to display his faithfulness. Did you guys know that? Like, big surprise, right? Wow, I can't believe that, right? You guys have seen the movie. Like, you know that that's the, he's the one he made the promise, and, he, and God chose Moses to be the one to display his faithfulness true. So the promise of Genesis 15 is going to be delivered through this person, Moses, of course. They're going to be slavery for 400 years. He's going to come and rescue. And then they're going to leave wealthy. That's just the promise. And so here's the fulfillment of it in Exodus chapter 12. So in Exodus chapter 12, look in verse 31. What happens? Pharaoh sends for Moses and Aaron during the night, bless you, and he says, get out! Leave my people and take the rest of the Israelites with you. Go and worship the Lord as you requested. Take your flocks and herds and be gone! And so, verse 35, the people of Israel did as Moses had instructed. They asked, the, this is what he asked them to do. It's crazy. You've been a slave for 400 years there. They've hated you. They've whipped you. They've beaten you. They've been ruthless to you. Now go ask them for all their goodies. Really? You want me to go ask the guy who's been whipping me for the last 15 years of my life? And you want me to go up to him and say, hey man, that's a nice Rolex. Can I get that? That's what you want me to do? Yes, that's what I want you to do. Okay, we'll do that. So they did exactly what he said. And what, look what it says. Who, who's got the power? Does Moses have the power? No. The Lord caused the Egyptians to look favorably on the Israelites. And they gave the Israelites whatever they asked for. So they stripped the Egyptians of their wealth. And he said way back to, to Abraham that I'm going to have them set free and they're going to leave wealthy. Hundreds of years ago, 600 years ago, he said this. And he somehow the Holy Spirit of God penetrated the minds of the Egyptians to want to give them all of their goods, all of their gold and their silver and their wealth. That's crazy. But that's what happened. He's faithful. 640 years later. We can't even think about that. That's beyond our minds. We only live, what, 70, 80, 90 years maybe? 640 years later, perfect, perfect what he said would happen. It's exactly what happened. And the thing that's amazing about it is that it involves a nation that doesn't know him, that doesn't like him, that won't obey him, but they did. Like, he didn't have any cooperation by Pharaoh and his people. They hated God. Pharaoh said, who is this God that I should listen to him? You want to know who I am? This is who I am. And he, they obeyed him. They submitted to him. They didn't want to. He caused the Egyptians because he cannot deny himself. He made a promise, and my reputation will not be smeared. That's why. 
Well, aren't you supposed to save the fulfillment to the end? Isn't that the way a message usually is in church? Here's the issue, here's the problem, or here's the promise, and here's what's going on, and then wham, the fulfillment, and, and he makes it come to pass. God is faithful, amen, and you drop the mic and you sing songs, and woo! Awesome. Well, that is the most important part. God's faithfulness displayed yet again, for sure. But notice the gap between Genesis 15, when God makes a promise to Abraham about the descendants. And that gap between Genesis 15 and Exodus 12, when it actually happens. There's a gap between the two. And church, listen, that's where you live. How many people have sensed that God has made a promise to them about anything in their life, either through the word or in prayer, or someone spoke it to you? We've all, like we all have this. If you didn't raise your hand, you have this promise. That someday when you draw your last breath, the next thing that's going to happen is you're going to be in heaven. Like that's a promise, right? Have anyone, have you been there yet? No. It says in scripture, nobody has gone and come back except Jesus. So none of us have been there, but we got this promise. So there's this promise over here, and then there's a fulfillment over here, and that's a gap. And we need to study life in the gap. Because that's where we all live right now. The promise is coming. According to his word, it's going to happen. But we still have these, this time that we live in, that we're living in right now. That's the gap. And Abraham had a gap. And Moses had a gap. And you have a gap. And I have a gap. We all have the gap. Every single one of us. We all have it. We're all in it right now. Now, listen. Moses becomes this mighty deliverer. Okay, we, we've seen the movie, like I said. We know he's the guy that God uses to deliver his people. But it didn't really start out real good. See, being used by God was a long and crooked and broken road. So here's how it starts out for this mighty deliverer that God chooses. The first thing we know is that Pharaoh is, is intimidated by how many people are growing in the, Israel, in, the, in, the, in the Hebrew nation. And he's intimidated about that. We read about that, right? If we don't do something about this, they're going to take over. And we can't have that. So what does he do? He says, I want every little boy that's born to the Hebrew nation, I want you to kill them. I want you to chuck them in the Nile. You know, so they'll either drown or, you know, they got huge crocodiles over there. Huge crocs, right, over in the Nile in, in Egypt. You've seen the videos of National Geographic, you know, where the, the little, poor little antelope or something is sitting there trying to take a drink and then, Rawr! this dinosaur comes running out of, comes out of the water and eats them. Like, that's what's in the Nile over there. So the Pharaoh says, I want you to chuck all the little baby boys that are born to the Israelite nation. I want you to throw them in the river and kill them. And so, that's, like, sick. But Moses' mom, like, this next part's kind of weird because we, we've seen the movie, and we see that Moses' mom, she's scared for Moses' life, her little boy. And, and, a, and a good mom would be, you know, concerned. I get all that. So what does she do? Well, like, well, the Pharaoh says, if the, if the little boys are born, chuck them in the river. So what does she do? She chucks them in the river. <laughs> like, I don't understand all that, right? She takes a basket, and she puts tar in it, and so it would float, and she chucks them in the river. Like, there's crocs in the river, dude. Like, what are you doing, right? So if I'm, I'm just saying, if I was the mom, this is why I love the Bible, because it's just so gritty and true and, 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 and honest. Like, if I was the mom... I wouldn't chuck my baby. I would like, I'd try to escape at least, right? I'd just, I'd jump on my camel and I'd be out of here. But I'd go to like Jordan or something, right? That's what I would do. But she doesn't, she chucks. The, like it makes sense now, hindsight's twenty twenty. the sovereignty of God, somehow this baby gets put into the river and floats. I mean, I've never been to the Nile, but you know it's like a huge river, right? It's like kind of like Mississippi, but bigger. Like this big, huge, it's not like a little creek going down your property. It's like, you can barely see the other side of it, <coughs> that kind of river. And, and sometimes it's like super rough. It's not like, you know, gentle, sitting by the creek, you know, studying, eat, drinking your coffee. No, it's the Nile River, crocodiles and, <coughs> right? And, and, and somehow, because God is faithful to his promise that the nations, right, so that you, the baby floats and is picked up by the Pharaoh's daughter. But when she's doing this, 
She doesn't, she's not, who's in charge of God's sovereignty? Me or you? Or I mean, like, he, like, so you don't know? You would, what is she, she chucks on the room and hopes for the best. That's like a really bad plan. But that's what she does. She chucks them in the river, and somehow, of all the acreage, the, the hundreds and hundreds of miles of big open water, the, the baby floats into the hands of the Pharaoh's daughter. <laughs> What's the chance? It's insane, right? And she picks this little baby up, who should have been killed, and she raises him in the castle, in the palace of the Pharaoh. I, I hate to use the word luck, but this is a lucky kid, man. You know what I mean? Like, come on. And she raises him, but then he grows up in the palace. Great education, great food, great clothing, opulence, spoiled brat. And he kills a guy. He, he's, he's Jewish. He knows now. He's, it's been revealed to him that he's not like them. He's, he's one of them, the slaves. And he goes out and he sees this Egyptian guy beating one of his Hebrew men, and Moses kills the guy. And it says in the scripture, again, I love the scripture, it's so brutal and honest, it says he hides the guy's body in the sand. It's like Hebrew mafia back then, right? Hides the guy in the sand, and then of course the, the, the Pharaoh follows suit, he puts a hit on Moses. That's what you do in the mafia, right? It says that he's, he's going to kill Moses for doing this. And so what does he do? He runs off, and for like 40 years, he disappears into the wilderness and he just becomes this shepherd. So we had to study the life in the gap. When you look at this history of Moses and what he's been through and all that, do you ever feel like your weaknesses and failures and fears would kind of limit God's ability to work powerfully in your life and use you powerfully like through your life? to advance his kingdom? Do you ever feel that way? Like Moses did. I mean, if you read his story, it says when God came to him with all this history, God said, I want you. And he's like, me? Well, who am I? And he, he looked at his own mirror and said, like, I'm, I'm nothing. Why, why? There's other men that are better than me. Why, who am I? And why would they believe me? And, and, and I'm not a good speaker, he said. I can't speak well. I can't lead. I've failed. I've done all these things. And he was kind of concerned. Like, I don't think you could really use me, God. Well, I'm like that. So you, I might ask that question. You might not raise your hand. But I feel like that. Like, don't let the microphone fool you. I feel like that. The reason I feel like that is because I'm taught that. That's the culture that we live in. That's the air that we breathe as Americans. When you get fired from a couple of jobs and then you fill out another um, application, those people looking at that going, eh, I don't know, man. He's kind of high risk. She's kind of a, eh, I don't know. What if you, I mean, you start thinking it too, right? You start filling out applications, maybe you just start giving up hope. Like, I don't even want to fill out an application where nobody will hire me. What if you have a felony? Past failures, present problems. Like, nobody will hire you, it seems like, when you have a felony. When you've had some failure in your life, you just... What if you're great, your GPA wasn't quite high enough and you don't qualify? And what if maybe you only got a GED and not a high school diploma? What if you've had some relationship train wrecks over the years like I've had like I still can't believe she said yes to me that's God's grace because I mean, seriously did you know that when I, I, I don't know if you're aware of this but in our American culture if you've had some marriage failure do you know that you've been branded that there's a name for you they call you high risk that's what you are you're high risk because of your past failures and so maybe you're just not going to qualify to be someone's spouse. But see, that's not how God operates. That's the good news. See, God chose Moses, who was the orphaned, murderous, fugitive shepherd. Right? The shepherd, the low man on the totem pole, the lowest of the low in the socioeconomic scale of the time was the shepherd. And God chose that Moses to be his mighty deliverer. God, listen, I barely graduated high school myself. 
Like Mr. Levine, our vice principal, said for the walk through of the stage to get your diploma, there's going to be two rehearsals. And if any of you miss even one, you don't get to walk with your class. I miss both because I was wasted. I still don't know my multiplication tables to this day. I sold porn. I sold, I made, manufactured, and sold drugs. I was a drunk. I'm a marriage train wreck, and I was homeless. But God chose me to plant this church. And God chose me to, to, to share the gospel with 250 million people across the earth through CNN and Fox News and all the, the tabloids and newspapers and radio shows because of that thing right there. Like, he could have used any church, but he chose me. And he chose this Moses to baptize now like over 250 people in tanks and pools, introducing them into their life with Christ over the years. So listen, don't tell me that God can't work powerfully through you and your failures because I don't have ears for that. I don't want to hear it. If he can use me, he can use the Moses of old, he can use you. Okay? Moses was in the gap. And I'm in the gap and you're in the gap and sometimes God's faithfulness is ugly for sure. But sometimes God's faithfulness, will, you know, this, will, this will connect with all of you. Sometimes God's faithfulness is slow. <laughs> right? When is this going to happen, God? You promised me, God! So, so last week I was, at, uh, I was up here at this new Taco Bell, which is heaven sent. <laughs> and uh, so you guys know about the beefy Frito burrito? Oh, my God. Oh, yes. But, dude, I'm telling you, that's the, that is modern day manna, and it is a, it's the best a dollar can buy. You, if, I used to do three of them. I'm trying to lose weight, and so I am down to two. But it is the best, like a dollar, and you feel like your gut's going to explode. It is the best thing ever. And I go there all the time, and I get them, because and, and they're a dollar. And they're super yummy, and fire sauce, and all that kind of stuff, and... It's so good. It's so good. But so I was there last week, one of the times, and, 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 and I was in line at this fast food joint. And I was in line for 10 minutes. I wanted to kill someone. <laughs> right? I mean, do you ever get there where you just like, you're hangry, and, and you, you just like, 10 minutes! 10 minutes! Like, it felt like forever, right? It was 10 minutes. What is 10 minutes? The deal is that we don't like to wait, right? God's faithfulness is slow sometimes, and we as humans, we don't like to wait, right? We, we, we think in 24-hour blocks. I got today. What can I get done today? I gotta get, I, and I'm the worst of that. You can ask my wife. I am the worst. If, if something, if I don't feel like I accomplished something in God's mission in, in, during the day, like I'll come up here at midnight and I'll paint something. Like I have to get something done. I'm, I'm mission minded, right? I got to get this thing done. Task oriented. I got, it's because I only got this day and I got to get something done today or else it was a total failure, right? That's the way we think. And we think in not only 24 hour blocks, but we think in maybe, you know, 70, 80, 90 years, like I said, like that's all we get. So we're thinking, like, i got to accomplish something with this time that I have. But God, he's, he's slow to move sometimes because he's not in that framework. He has a different framework. He's not trapped in the framework of our time. He was and is and is to come. He's the God that's everlasting. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He's not trapped in the same time space that we are. And so his perspective is a lot different. And his plans are different than ours. And so here's Moses in the gap between the promise of deliverance and it actually happening. And so God comes to this guy Moses and says, with all your failures and all your fears and all your concerns about being qualified, whatever, I want you to go to Pharaoh and I want you to get this done for me right here, right now. And so I want you to go to Pharaoh and get my people out. And the promise that I made, remember way back to Abraham, it's going to happen. It's going to happen, but I want you to go do it. So go before the Pharaoh and I want you to take your staff and I want you to turn into a snake. Awesome. 
So he does. I'm going to try this again with you guys. Can you do that? Yes, yes right? Because <laughs> it's not your snake, it's not your staff, it's God's, right? You're just the yes sir guy and gal. So, so, so he goes and he does this incredible miracle, right? No go. Didn't work. I mean, it happened, but they're still not released. They're not delivered yet. So now I want you to go back to the Pharaoh, and I want you to do this miracle. I want you to turn the Nile River. That's, their, that's like their light. Like, you know, we have a heart that, like, without it, we're dead. The Nile River was their heart. That was the basis of their whole world. It was centered around the Nile. Without the Nile, there's no crops, there's no nothing. You gotta, I want you to turn the Nile to blood. So he, go, he steps to the Pharaoh and, and, and turns the, the Nile River into blood. Let my people go or else, fine, blood. No go. Still didn't work. So I want you to go before the Pharaoh, <laughs> and I want you to, hey, anyone been in a house with fleas? Raise your hand. Like, it's disgusting, right? You feel them? So the next thing he says, I want you to go to Pharaoh, and this is what's going to happen. The dust of the ground is going to come alive, and it's going to turn into gnats, like fleas all over your body, right? And it's like billions of them all over, and I want you to do that. And, they, and it happens, no go. <sighs> okay, I want you to go back to Pharaoh, and I want, like, the gnats on your ankles and knees weren't bad enough yet. So instead of that, I'm going to have, like, flies. So they're like gnats that are like pterodactyls, big gnats, all over, and they're going to swarm all over the people. So go do that. No go. <clears throat> and then I want you to go back to Pharaoh, <laughs> and I want you to tell him that, we're gonna, that I'm going to kill all your livestock. No go. And then I want you to go back to Pharaoh. I'm, are you feeling it now, man? Right? I've been faithful, Lord. You keep telling me to do stuff, I do it. And, uh, I want you to go back to Pharaoh and, and, and release this. Let my people go or else I'm going to have, this is kind of gross, festering boils. Think of the worst zit you've ever seen in your life. All over your body. Yeah, Ew, gooey gross, right? All of your body. Still no delivery. Okay, I want you to go to Pharaoh. <laughs> and I want you to unleash this hailstorm that's going to destroy property and agriculture and hurt your animals, maybe kill some of them. Guess what? No go. Like, you got to start wondering, like, when did frustration set in for Moses? You know, when, when is he just going to start wondering, is this really going to happen, or are you just messing with me? That's real, right? Come on. I mean, you all felt like that sometimes, right? You're messing with me, God. You're, mess you're jacking with my life. Arr! And you get mad, right? Some of us have been there. I've been there, man. I have been there. I have been fetal on the ground, crying and like Fred Flintstone, and I'm cussing him out, going, why? Because I thought he was messing with me. I guess it's in the name. You know, as I was writing this, all this stuff down and reflecting on, does God mess with me and trying all these things and it doesn't work and I keep going and he keeps telling me to do this and you know, he's made some promises to me about this church years ago. And I've had a lot of failures. Like, I've had a lot of disappointments along the way. And I keep getting into the ring and fighting and swinging. And I get knocked down. And then I swing again. And I get knocked down. And I keep swinging. And I get knocked down. And then my wife is like Mickey on Rocky movies. Get back in there, kid. You know, and she puts me back in. And I want to quit and send my resume out. She's like, no, you've got a job to do. Pastor your people. And I just... And I realized as I was taking these notes that I was much like Moses. I, I thought that this message was for you guys and it was really for me because I was dealt another blow this week, like a really awful one, you know? And I was like, golly. You know, like, like I knew it was coming. And this is where, you're, you know, your pastor fails too. And I just, maybe it's just for you to hear this, but... <clears throat> I 
kind of knew this was going to happen. And I was waiting on someone's answer. And it was, it's so bad that while I was praying, I was like, Lord, can you just please give me this victory? Like it's been one failure in, in this specific area, one after another. I was like, can you just please let me win this one time? I mean, that's the way I was feeling too. But people are consistent. <laughs> Boom. <clears throat> so I had to do what I start, I've been telling you guys to do. Remember I said I can move forward with confidence if I can look back and see consistency. And so in this moment when I was kind of upset and I was actually studying, I'm doing this, and I'm thinking about this, I began to look back. And I got to see God's consistency, not only in what I've been preaching, but in my own life, thinking about the things that he's done for me and always been true to his word. And I began to feel confidence start to swell back inside of me. And I got to be able to press on and press in and dig my heels in deeper again and know that God is faithful to his word. And, he, and all these things that he promises, they will come to pass. And I just needed to experience that for myself. And Moses, as you can see, he was faithful in the gap. God said go. He probably was like, man, really? <laughs> so God says, Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh again. And I want you to tell him that this time it's going to be locusts. They're going to eat all the agriculture and ruin everything for you. So he did. And guess what? No go. <laughs> and then he went to Pharaoh again. And he said, this time, because you won't listen, I'm going to bring darkness to the land. And this, it says in the Bible that the darkness, this is kind of weird, you can maybe try to imagine it, that the darkness was so thick that they could feel it. How do you feel the absence of light? It's almost like a picture of hell. Where his light is not. You can feel it. But still, no delivery. No promise fulfilled. And can we just remind ourselves that every single time God says to Moses, I need you to be faithful. I need you to trust me. And I need you to go to Pharaoh. You got to remember that every single time he went to Pharaoh, his life's on the line. The, the Pharaoh is an unchallenged, mad tyrant with a God complex. And if you go before him and he feels disrespected, you're dead. On the, like, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. There's no questioning. There's no jury of your pairs. There's no trial. No, kill him. And the guards just kill him right there on the spot. That's Pharaoh. He doesn't need anyone's permission. And that's what Moses is faced with, to be faithful. And Pharaoh makes it very, very clear to Moses in Exodus 10, 28 that that's the situation. He says, get out of here. Get out of my land. Take your stuff and go. And I'm warning you that the next time you see my face, you're going to die. You come, you step to me again, and you're a dead man. And sometimes when God's trying to fulfill a promise in your life, you're going to need to get out of your comfort zone and do something that God will use to accomplish his purpose in your life. That means you maybe have to do something that's different than what you... If you want to see the promise fulfilled, maybe he's waiting on you to do something different that he can use to make it happen. Maybe you don't have to read about Jesus saying when you fast. Maybe you need to start fasting. And you need to let God know, I'm serious about my desire for you to grow in me and to use me. And I need to hear from you. And I need to starve my flesh and feed the Spirit. And I mean what I say, Lord. And so maybe you need to start fasting. Maybe you need to start giving. Maybe you're stinking broke and he wants to deliver you in abundance, but you're so tight with your money. When the, when the preacher says, put something in the offering plate, you sit there and go, no, I can't because I need it for my stuff. Maybe that's why you're broke. Maybe 90% with God is better than 100% alone. 
Maybe he wants to deliver you, but you're stingy. Maybe you need to <clears throat> change your priorities. Maybe you need to change your schedule. Maybe you need to change your career. Maybe you need to stop sleeping around with people. Maybe you need to stop getting drunk and doing drugs. Maybe you need to stop settling for, that's just the way I am. It's not, yeah, that is the way you are, but God wants to change the way you are. And maybe he can't do in your life because you're stubbornly holding on to things. And you're not doing crazy things. So you can see crazy results. <clears throat> I want to see God's kingdom grow. And I was working at Bill Bryan Chrysler selling cars for 50, 60 hours a week. And the church was going nowhere because I was going nowhere. Until my faithful wife said, quit. And I'll live in a car with you if I have to. Go past to your church. That's daring. It's daring to go from making a hundred grand a year to making I'm not I'm not like unhappy with what you guys pay me, but I get twenty four grand a year. That's what we live on. That's a bold move to go from a hundred to less than a quarter of what you were making because I wanted to see God do something. And I wasn't giving him what he deserved. I was throwing him my scraps. And, and, and I remember being at the dealership, and I knew the church started at 6, and I'd be in the bathroom getting dressed like, like this and running out. So I'm like, all right, see you guys! And like trying my best to just throw something out at you guys. That's when you met me. That's giving God scraps. How is he going to do mighty things through my life if I'm throwing him scraps? I need to do something different. There's a guy, his name is Mark Batterson. He's the pastor of National Community Church in Washington, D.C., Thriving church, great church, um, in a city that desperately needs a good gospel work. And uh, he's also a successful author. He's written a lot of books. Um, I've read many of them, really great stuff. He wrote a book called In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day. It's the story of Shamgar. You should read it. He wrote Primal. He wrote, wrote Wild Goose Chase. It was a book about the Holy Spirit. It's the only book I ever read in one day. I could not put it down. And he wrote a, wrote a book called The Circle Maker. Maybe some of you have read that. But Mark Batterson said that, this about the, this subject we're talking about. He said, if you aren't willing to put yourself in this is crazy situations, you'll never experience this is awesome moments. I would just melt it down to just say this. You need to be willing to do uncomfortable things to see unbelievable things. You have to. So remember what Pharaoh said to Moses. He said, listen, the next day you see my face, you will die. Now we're talking about getting uncomfortable, getting into some, this is crazy. I want to see something happen here, awesome God. So I need to put myself in some crazy situations. Next time you see me, you will die. And if you die, the promise dies, right? So <laughs> trusting only in God's faithfulness, in the face of you come to me and you die, he steps to Pharaoh again. And he doesn't say frogs. And he doesn't say gnats. He says, God's going to kill your firstborn, including yours. Talk about out of your comfort zone. Talk about, this is crazy. Talk about taking a risk, right? He walked to the most powerful man on the planet. Uh, at his whim, you die. And he's already promised him, if you come to me, you will die. And he doesn't just come to him. He says, no, I'm not going to die. Your kid's going to die. You want to see unbelievable things? You got to do some uncomfortable things and on that released they're free and the promise is completely fulfilled perfectly upon that and Israel is set free to leave Egypt with all the gold and silver listen 400 years of poverty and slavery now completely free and wealthy just as God had promised. God is faithful. And so, let's wrap this thing up. You and I are in the gap. 
We're in a gap, right? You, he's made some promises to you. Hasn't happened yet. We're going to trust that it will based on this history and his resume, but we're in the gap. Here's the promise. Here's the fulfillment. Here's the gap. This is where we live. And God is faithful, but he's also desiring to work in you. See, that's always going to be part of the fulfillment. He wants to do something in you before he'll do something through you. There's a promise he made, but part of fulfilling the promise is he's got to mold and shape you into the person to receive it. And so it says in the scriptures, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, it is God's will that you are sanctified. That means changed. Romans 8, 29 says God chose you, that's awesome, to become like his son. See, this is important. You've got to know this because he can't change you into something if you're already that something. And you're not. He wants to change you into something before he can work through you. That means that God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. Do you see? He's not going to come to you like he, he came to Moses who was completely unprepared with a horrible history and chose him and then equipped him to do this amazing work. And he's going to do the same thing with you like I told you before. I don't have ears to hear that God couldn't use me because he used me. And I know that no one in this room, I know you all, and I know some of the stuff that at least you've been through and none of you are worse than me. I am a despicable human being. And you're sitting here listening to me teach you. And if he could do that, he can use anybody. Anybody. He'll take the ones that don't seem worthy. He'll take the ones who don't seem able. And if they're, they're willing to continue to faithfully follow his lead into some uncomfortable situations, things that you don't want to do. The Bible, every page is uncomfortable. Every page is filled with stuff that you don't want to do. It doesn't sit well with you. It rubs against you the wrong way. And if you will do this stuff, you will see the chains of oppression break off of your life. He will use you for stuff, and all of us will be truly blessed and highly favored. That's what we're looking for, right? I wish Greg was here this morning so he could say it for me. But that's what we're looking for. Amen? All right, awesome. God speak to you today? I hope. Awesome. Can you pray with me? And then we're going to... Let's just worship him for a little bit. How about 15 minutes of just the best worship you can come up with? Could I ask you to do that? 15, remember, we think in 24-hour blocks. Could you just do this? Don't think, I know that everyone, ha, everyone raise your hand if you have something you're supposed to do after you leave here. Okay? Could you just like not think about that? For 15 minutes. For 15 minutes, why don't you s praise him and sing to him and during that 15 minutes, let him sing over you with the words you're singing to him. And just feel free, right? Just watch. You don't get this from Def Leppard concerts and Deep Purple and Cyndi Lauper. You get this by worshiping the king. There's something about worship, and we're about to enter into that, into that arena right now. We get to worship the king and connect with him like this. So I'm going to pray with you, and then let's just get to our feet and just worship him. Listen, for all you old people here in the church, listen, let's just be honest. You always wanted to just cut loose and worship, right? Because and churches didn't want you to. Because you had, if you got misbehaved, your mom would grab your ear and don't you do that, right? You get to do that right here. You get to just worship, listen, as if Jesus was right here. Because he is. So just imagine, visualize that. As you're singing, Jesus being right here, and you are in the throne room of God, and you're exalting him, and you're worshiping him with the praise that he is so worthy of. You get to do that right here and now. You know what? Let's just do that right now. Just let's do that right now. I don't want to say another word.